the Bain Free Radio Hour. This time on the podcast, The General Series Reborn, Alien Judgment Day, the long-awaited manly men of Bane Pole, then Frank Chadwick discusses gaming, intellectual property in space, and whether or not Raymond Chandler could beat up Dashiell Hammett, a writing suggestion from Elf Home creator Wynn Spencer, and part three of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Also with me for the interview portion of the podcast will be Bain editor emeritus Hank Davis. Today we have an excellent talk with How Dark the World Becomes author Frank Chadwick. We have a sensory-evoking, world-building writing suggestion from Elf Home creator Wynn Spencer and the continuing serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, provided by Audible.com. First, though, some news. Hey, the April books have arrived. Bain has three great new offerings for you this month in hardcover, trade paperback, and even leather. First off is April hardcover, The Heretic. This is a continuation of the legendary General or Raj Whitehall saga, known by some, begun by S.M. Sterling and David Drake in books such as The Hammer and The Forge, and continued by Eric Flint and David Drake in The Tyrant, The Reformer. These are all based on characters and stories that David Drake creates, and uh, we co-authors follow along in the master's footsteps. I say we because the newest author is me, Tony Daniel. In addition to being an editor here at Bain, I'm also a Bain author, and I've co-written this book. The idea of these books is that galactic civilization has fallen, and thousands of years have passed on the various once-settled worlds. People forget about the wonders of the past and fall into Dark Age ways. The Heretic is what Dave Drake refers to as his Egypt book. In this one, a young hero breaks the hold of a, an evil AI, his name is Zentrum, by the way, and raises his uh, milieu, his civilization, from a static low level, similar to the first kingdom of ancient Egypt, except that here people ride dinosaurs and fight with muskets. It's a pretty fun milieu. The characters are realistic, as you would expect from a book that has Dave's name on it, and it's got some nice battle scenes, if I do say so myself. It was a great pleasure to write with Dave, I can tell you. And he does let me call him Dave, yes. Also in April is Charles E. Gannon's debut solo novel, Fire with Fire. Chuck Gannon is the co-author of several Bane books, so you'll recognize his name. These include Starfire series entry Extremis, written with Steve White, and the best-selling Ring of Fire uh, series alternate history novel, 1636, The Papal Stakes, that was just out co-authored with Eric Flint. In Fire with Fire, an investigative reporter travels to a newly settled world and figures out whether a primitive local species was once sentient, enough so to have built a lost civilization. Now this is pure adventure uh, and idea-driven SF. Heinlein, watch out, Chuck Gannon is here. Also at the website, we have a prequel story to Fire with Fire by Chuck, in our free fiction slot for the month. It's called The Spec. So check that out, as well as the great monthly nonfiction, which this month is a piece by NASA scientist and Bain author Les Johnson, Dr. Just Les Johnson, on the Alpha Centauri extrasolar planet. That's a great piece. And finally, we have this month the reissue of On Basilisk Station, the very first Honor Harrington novel and it's in a handsome leather-bound edition. These things are great looking. I'm holding one in my hands right now, and it's nice. It's got beautiful gold lettering on the outside, including a Royal Manticoran Navy insignia. The end papers look great, and 
just opening it up. The frontispiece, it's a full-color version of the original uh, edition covers, the hardcover and the mass market. So this one is a collector's item, no doubt about it. Now, speaking of very special things, this month's contest at the Bane.com website is a doozy. Let me just say this was streamed up by Bane publisher Tony Weisskopf, who is solely responsible for its risque content. Yep, it's the Manly Men of Bane contest. April's contest is a poll for ladies' choice of the hottest of the Bane book cover dudes. It's also a gentleman's choice for which one of these cool guys best represents your vision of manliness. And, of course, one might apply both criteria to one's selection if one were so inclined. Hey, after you take the poll, you can enter the drawing to win a signed hardcover edition of The Heretic by yours truly, Tony Daniel and David Drake, the new entry in uh, the General series. I will say that Tony had me pick out the initial cover images for these guys, and then she was uh, like, eh, let's refine this a bit. Not sure you had the whole idea right here. And she gave me the dude she really wanted for the poll. Check it out. It's, it's really a lot of fun. You can find more information on all of these at the Bain website, Bain.com, B-A-E-N.com, of course. You can discuss them and everything else at the podcast forum at Bain's Bar. There's a link to this forum on the podcast page at the Bain.com website. So go over the forum and join in the discussion, please. I think you'll find a lot of cool folks there. Bain Books, the heart of fantasy and science fiction, it has been said. It said well. We want to welcome Frank Chadwick on the pod today. Hi, Frank. Hi, how you doing? Frank Chadwick is the author of How Dark the World Becomes, a science fiction novel that's just out from Bane last February. He's also the author of upcoming Bane novel, The Forever Engine, which is a science-based steampunk novel. Now, if you're saying, oh, here comes another steampunk novel, I've seen a million of them, I think you'll be in for a surprise, because Frank is one of the ur-creators of the steampunk form. How can that be? We'll find out in a moment. Frank is also a nonfiction New York Times number one best-selling author of the, the Desert Shield Fact Book, and he's the author of over 200 books, articles, and columns on military history and military affairs. Now, if you happen to be a board game player and you're thinking, wow, Chadwick, now that name sounds familiar, that's because it is. Frank is the creator and designer of hundreds of board games, and uh, these are the famous well-loved ones, folks, not not just any board games. <laughs> for instance, Traveler, the foundation game for science fiction role-playing, that's Frank's game. Uh, Space 1889, the steampunk classic, that's Frank's. Um, you can correct me if I make any mistakes on that, Frank. Yeah, let me jump in and uh, correct you on one thing, and that is that I designed uh, Traveler the New Era, and I did a lot of work on Traveler, but really the, the original game is Mark Miller. He's really the creator of that original of, a, of, of the, tr the original Traveler game. But other than that, so far, it sounds good. What's that Civil War game that I've seen a lot of board gamers play? Divided. House, House Divided. Divided. That's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's really probably the, I think, in my opinion, the best board game I did of, of, of all the board games I've done. I'm not a game person, but I, I've been working with Frank for about a year now as one of his editors, and I, and I know him as only a very good writer, but I started doing research to talk to him, uh, and I uncovered the fact unknown to me until till now that there are all these board gamers out there who worship the ground Frank walks on. I mean, there is some effusive stuff about his games out there on the web. Uh, I've heard you con compared to Orson Welles, Frank. So high praise, Frank. Really? Let's have it. I yeah. But it, uh, well, that's that's very nice. I've yeah. certainly done. I, I've been around in that in that field a lot. That's yeah. true. And I, and I've always enjoyed. Uh, I, I've enjoyed my work there. And uh, and you know when you really love what you're doing, I think it shows. Uh -huh. Which which game is your Citizen Kane? As long as you're compared <laughs> to Orson Welles. As we just mentioned earlier, A House Divided, and that's probably the game I've, the board game I've done that has the most longevity. It, it's, it just came out, I forget when the original game came out, but it's been out now, uh, uh, in, in, in editions in Dutch and German and, uh, you know, most European languages, and there's a new edition out from Mayfair Games, who's, uh, one of the large 
adult game publishers in the U.S. They just came out with a new edition uh, in honor of the, uh, well, in honor of all the celebration of the Civil War uh, history that's going on. Right, so it's that one's really been around a long time. It keeps coming back. 150th yeah, anniversary uh, coming up. So. Uh, that's yeah. House Divided is the name of that. That's the a house divided. A yeah. house divided. And that's yeah, that that is a uh, if I do say so, it's a really it's a good really good game. So, all right, well let's talk about your books. Let's have it. How does your game creating background fit in with your fiction? Or does it? Oh, it does. It does. Um the I I've, I've done a lot of board games, but I did a, I've done a bunch of role playing stuff as well. Travelers a role playing game. Um and uh you mentioned uh, I think you mentioned Space 1889 uh, and I've done some other role playing games as well and the world building in that is not a lot different than the sort of world building you have to do uh in a science fiction world because you've got to you've got everything's got to work um it's uh it's an environment that people have to go in and interact with and uh so that so that necessity to think about how a world works and what's unique and different and interesting about it, but at the same time isn't just so crazy. It just kind of, the wheels come off and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, uh, that's very similar. That, that part of the exercise is very similar. Um, the, the, the need to come up with adventure settings for players and adventure prompts is pretty similar to plot building. Um, and a lot of the work you do on background characters that the characters interact with is is real similar to character development so or at least the initial character design the thing that drew me away from games when i was younger was the fact that it didn't seem to have and it was probably because the people that were running the games that i was playing didn't have storytelling ability and you but you say that you actually generate plots uh and and story ideas from in the same manner as as game design yeah because one of the things you do in uh, as a game publisher, as a game, once, once the game, the role playing game is done, you usually then, uh, do a number of adventures that people buy and they're kind of pre-plotted. You plug characters into them and everything, but there's, there's a, um, a prompt for the adventure, there's a point of the adventure, there's, it goes someplace, you interact with people along the way who complicate things. I mean, there's the whole notion of, you know, initial, uh, inciting event complication and resolution which is you know very much um the arc of most stories um yeah, certainly absolutely. modern stories you know the uh um so so yeah that's very similar uh it, it got, designers have to engage in that kind of storytelling and they and the reason they write those things is because a lot of people have some difficulty storytelling and so you write these adventure prompts that help them and if you you know so that's uh so that's very, very similar. So in now, a way, when you're designing a game, you're building in the possibilities for people to tell a story by thinking of possible ways that they might tell a story. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, the actual craft of communicating the story, the actual, you know, and, and, and resolving the adventure, that's, that's different. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's separate. But I mean, so it's not like there's a 100% convergence between writing fiction and writing uh writing role playing right. games. But so you don't roll lot, your uh you don't roll your characters uh hit points in your books? <laughs> no, I no, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that at all. I I don't think of the books really in game terms at all. Um it's just some of the tools that you use uh are have kind of been pre honed. Um it, it really is a very diff writing fiction, having done both is a very, very different um prospect. Um, th than than that, but there are a lot of tools that are similar, and and, and that you, so you certainly kind of have a leg up having done a lot of that for a lot of years. Well, let's talk about the books for a little bit. Now, I have it on authority from uh, Bain publisher, my boss Tony Weiskopf, who bought your your first novel. That she had no idea of your gaming creds when she bought it. She just thought it was great. Ah. She didn't know who you were. Uh, really, she thought it was a well realized, wonderfully written book. So let's talk about your your first. Uh, novel with Bain, How Dark the World Becomes. It's got a, a great first-person narrative voice that I have to say really reminds me of Larry Correa's Monster Hunter International, uh, who's been hit with us lately. Uh, Sasha in How uh -huh. Dark is a, he's a very different character than Owen Pitt, the main character of, uh, of Larry's books, but there is a similar quality of 
here's a guy who will do whatever it takes to survive. And then they're both in very tough worlds. Um, can you kind of set up the world of how dark the world becomes and put Sasha, your main character, into it? Uh, yeah, how dark the world becomes takes place oh a little over a hundred years in in the future. Um, it assumes that about thirty or forty years from now, we're contacted by a, an alien spacefaring civilization that's actually five different races uh, that have formed this stellar commonwealth. And we're invited to join. There's no conquest. There's no shooting or anything like that. The problem is they have very strict intellectual property covenants, um, which leave us behind the curve technologically with no real way to catch up without breaking the law. So humans, by the time the novel takes place, are really the, the third-class citizens in this stellar commonwealth. And that leaves them in some pretty crappy jobs. Um, but we have also insinuated ourselves in the criminal structure because we're really good criminals and uh and sasha is a is a um the second generation on a planet called Pizcatan where humans were imported to work uh the, the, the deal kind of fell apart they were, they live in a in, in a terrible situation and he's a a mob underboss basically in a a criminal organization. Now, Sasha was, and, uh, he doesn't remember Earth at all. Uh, I mean, he never was there. He's, he was, no, he was born on Pizcatan. He was never, he never lived on Earth. His parents were. His parents immigrated from Ukraine. And there are a lot of Ukrainians on Pizcatan. And, and, and of course, one of the things about the world that Sasha lives in is that there's no Earth government. There's no, each of these alien races don't have a, a single government for their race. There are, multiple nations within each of these uh, other uh, alien races, just as there are multiple national governments on Earth. So it's very, it's it's not a very monolithic um, uh, universe. It's one that's, uh, one of the things that bothers me in a lot of uh, science fiction world building is that people look at alien races as if they were a country, mm -hmm. and a pretty homogeneous country. You know, like everybody's kind of the same, and there's like one. You know, this is what the alien. This is the alien language. Well, one of the things that that, you, that Sasha's world has is, I mean, there's multiple alien languages. There's kind of a Mandarin, which is the official language of uh, of commerce and everything. But there's uh, there's multiple languages and there's multiple cultures, even among each of these um, alien races. They hang together with these uh, with these sort of libertarian covenants with each other that that are somewhat draconian. We find. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh huh. The uh, yeah the intellectual property covenants are the big problem because anything that's discovered, any information, any scientific uh, knowledge that's discovered, if it's the result of a previous discovery, belongs to the person who made. Previous discovery, and since we're behind the curve already, there's really nothing we can discover that's not somehow already owned by them. And so that's what puts us behind the curve uh, in, in terms of technology, and and that, and of course economically as well. So Sasha's Sasha's a, a, a very he's not incredibly successful, but he's real good at, at being a thug. Uh, he's not really a thug. What? How would you characterize him on P's guitar? Um, a reluctant thug. A reluctant. <laughs> He's a reluctant thug. He's a uh, um, the, the you know, crime offers him a way out of the crushing poverty that that the majority of humans on Pizcatan, um suffer from. But it's not. But the higher up he gets in the organization, the more problem, more moral problems he encounters. I mean, it's one thing just to be a second story guy stealing from rich. Baroque, who are the, the prominent uh, alien race on, on Pizcatan. But once he starts becoming higher in the organization, it becomes more violent. There are more difficult decisions to make, and it, and, and it kind of plays on him more and more. So he has some more difficult questions to uh, deal with yeah. as he gets higher up. And moral dilemmas, including when two alien kids show up. Oh, yeah, yes, with, with two alien children, with two alien children, two young children, who are the... Uh, the son and daughter of a very, very rich uh, Baroque uh, uh, businessman. Businessman's not quite the right word. 
uh, heir, heir to a fortune, one of the great fortunes in the Baroque, uh, of, of the Baroque. And, uh, he's been killed. His bodyguard's been killed. Um, and these kids are, someone's after them to kill them as well. And, uh, uh, this human woman, the, the, this human woman comes, uh, with these kids and, 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 and gets ha- Sasha's help in, uh, keeping them alive. Yeah. Because if they, because they are the inheritors of, of this in- incredible, uh, IP legacy. Well, well, they, he kind of finds out that as it goes along, but that's not really why he helps them. I yeah. mean, he helps them because, because they're two kids. They're two kids, yeah. Yeah. One thing I wanted to, uh, to bring in is also, um, Sasha, because we have so many military science fiction readers at Bain, um, Sasha winds up on a planet in the midst of a civil war, and the book kind of shifts there in tone. I mean, it keeps its hard-boiled science fiction edge, uh, which is great, the great, that great voice of Sasha. But now we, Sasha's a former soldier, right? And he's thrown into a, a conflict here. And, you do a really good job of depicting this, of who the sides are, and and we've got it. We've got a, a nice planetary battle done right here. Did do you think that your game designing history came in here? Oh sure. I mean, and not just the game design, but you know the interest in military history and military affairs. I mean, I, I, like I said, I've you know written some, well as you mentioned, I've written a bunch of other stuff too, some columns and uh, and books on military affairs and. It's been an interest of mine my whole life. So, um, and whenever you're, you've got an interest in something like that, I think there's a natural tendency to say, well, what's, where's this going? You know, I mean, what, <laughs> what, what's battle like, likely to be like in the future? Um, uh, what's going to change? What's going to stay the same? Um, you know, what are the kind of the constants in, in warfare in terms of, and, and this isn't, uh, an attempt to, the, the book doesn't really deal with, giant battles the you know in history changing things like that it's really a group of people who get in the middle of this and are trying to uh, just trying to get through it but all the stuff they encounter and have to deal with in the process of, of getting through that and of course it's a little touch of um xenophon's anabasis um the uh, you know which of course it informed, has informed literature for how you know ever since he wrote it you know this idea of a small group of soldiers Deep in enemy lines, mm-hmm. who have all their leaders killed, um, you know, by uh, by treachery. Yes. Um, you know that 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 story. Ever since Xenophon tells that story of how his Greek mercenaries got out of the Persian Empire, you know, people have been writing about it ever since. Andre Norton's Star Guard, which was a, a book I loved as a little kid, um, it is really a retelling in science fiction terms. Of Xenophon's Anabasis, so so there's certainly an element of that in in that fighting in terms of just the you know the situation they're in, but the technological aspects of it, yeah, that's a that's really kind of me wondering where this where small unit combat is going to go, and there's nothing tremendously radical in it, but but I think it is, you know, I I I, I, should, I would hope that it's pretty believable. Yeah, it's very well done, and uh, it's complemented by that great first-person voice that you do with Sasha, who who turns out to be uh, a multi-talented fellow, and it, it's a great book. So we're talking about uh, how dark the world becomes, which is uh, which is Frank's debut novel here at Bain. Let me ask you a few questions uh, about where you're coming from in general as a writer. I I've read okay. that you're a huge Tolstoy fan. Um, you quote him, you use him for titles. Um, I would wow. not call Sasha a standard Tolstoy character, perhaps. Maybe you would. <laughs> Where does the count come in with your work? I, I think Sasha wonders about the same sort of things that, um, oh, Andrei Bolkonsky and Pierre Bezhukov, the two main, two main male characters in, in War and Peace, wonder about. Um, the, he's, uh, the, the, the the issues that they kind of struggle with is to, you know, what is it in life that gives your life value and how do you find value in things? I mean, that that's, but he doesn't sound like it because he doesn't sound like a early 19th century Russian aristocrat. Right. He's a, <laughs> you know, he doesn't have that voice at all. Yeah. Um, but I, but I think that the sort of things that, that he, that he struggles with internally are, are very similar to those. Um, 
But as much as I love Tulsa, I guess Sasha's probably more, much more a, a product of of uh, the noir writers that I've you know, that I've that I've kind of uh, liked over the years. Raymond Chandler in particular, um, and John D. McDonald and, and James Lee Burke. Now I read a lot of James Lee oh, Burke. Oh yeah, I'm a I'm a huge Burke fan as well. Um, his Neon Rain yeah. is a uh... God. He, that guy can write. Holy cow! <laughs> But his Dave, you, know, you, you get a little bit of Dave Robichaux. You certainly get a lot of uh, Raymond Chandler's uh, Philip Marlowe and Sasha and Travis McGee. Yeah, and Travis you know, McGee. John and, McDonald, Travis and I was, I mean, I was certainly yeah. getting some Dashiell Hammett in there. Well, the Continental Op and Sasha. And... A, a, a little bit. I, 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 I have to say, I mean, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say I don't much like Hammett. <laughs> you oh, know, okay. but he's written a couple of great <laughs> things, but but a lot of this stuff, it's a, just he's a little too. Um, his people are a little too sociopathic, maybe. You know, they're just a little too alienated from everything for me to, to kind of, uh, have the same sympathy with them that I have for, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Chandler's, you know, Ch- Chandler's stuff. I mean, the guy acts that way, but he, underneath, he's really, he's really a softy underneath that hard shell. He really is. Yeah. Let's have it. The hard shell conceals another hard shell. Yes, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah. perhaps I'm not. Yeah. I'm not sure. I would say that. I, I mean, in a book like The Glass, let's not get into a di- dissection of Hammett. But yeah. I was thinking The Glass Key. We certainly okay. got. Yeah. We certainly got a main character who has a, uh, who has a lot going on inside, other than just the 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 need to to come out on top. Yeah, or, and I don't want to dismiss Hammett. It's just that he never his his characters never never really spoke to me. Sure, uh, sure. The way Chandler's Chandler's really do. Um, for whatever reason, you know, for whatever, and you can kind of, I can kind of rationalize it that Chandler's better than Hammett, but the truth is, you know, some stuff talks to you and some stuff doesn't. All right. We want to thank you for spending time with us today. Thanks, Frank. Oh, it was fun. Anytime. Yeah. Frank's uh, latest book is the science fiction novel, How Dark the World Becomes. It's in bookstores and online resell- retailers uh, right now, and you can, of course, get it at BainEbooks.com as well. For our writing suggestion this week, we interviewed Bain author Wynn Spencer, the author of the Elf Home series and other great Bain novels. We experienced some technical difficulties with our connection with Wynn, who was speaking with us from her home in the wilds of Hawaii, so we apologize in advance for the crackling you'll hear. Just think of it as a big digital luau fire. Or not. Anyhow, here's Wynn's excellent suggestion for writing this week, and please go to the Bain Bar Forum and show us what you come up with based on it. We like to ask Bain writers for a weekly writing suggestion for our listeners. Now, this can be whatever you want, but it's usually a seed crystal for a developing writer to take and shape into a piece of work. The result could be a paragraph or two, a short story, or heck, even a novel. But the caveat is it should be doable in a week. Anyway, listeners can then post their work and discuss on the podcast website. Today we welcome Bain author Wynn Spencer to the podcast. Hi, Wynn. Hi. Wynn Spencer is the creator of the Elf Home series, which includes Tinker, a great novel, love that one, Wolf Who Rules, and latest entry, Elf Home. She's also the author of the upcoming contemporary fantasy novel, Eight Million Gods, which is a novel about an American thriller writer, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, when living in Japan, who begins to see various supernatural beings from, uh, I believe it's the Shinto belief system. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So Eight Million Gods will be out in hardcover in June. We should also probably mention your book, Endless Blue, which is a science fiction book. Uh, so, Wynn, can you give us a writing suggestion for the coming week? Kind of riffing on the eight million gods. Um, people tend to think that their locale is boring and not very interesting, when actually they're very interesting to people who don't live um, there. I mean, you can go as little as 100 miles away, and your location becomes very exotic. Um, so what I was going to suggest as a writing suggestion 
is embrace something in your life that seems incredibly mundane and write a scene about it. And the thing I was going to suggest is a potluck. Now, when I was growing up, potlucks were in the cinder block, cinder block basement of our church. And the dishes were meat poor because all the adults were depression era babies. And we were a rich town. And we sat on metal chairs and passed dishes up and down like we were one family. And I never ate a whole lot because down the hall in the primary Sunday school classrooms on the low tables for the little kids was every type of pie you could imagine. And there would be coconut cream and lemon meringue and cherry and blackberry. And, oh, they were all my favorite. And then I moved to New England, and I discovered that potluck meant lobster and clams and corn on the cob and butternut squash, which I didn't even know existed until I moved to the Boston area. And the dessert was always, always blueberry. Blueberry pie or blueberry muffins or blueberry tarts. It's like there's no other fruit in New England. And now I'm living in Hawaii, and every Saturday our neighbor has a party, and they bring poke which is a poor men's sushi, lao lao, which is meat wrapped in leaves, and poi, which is a sweet purple mashed potato-like dish served cold. And the guests drive in pickup trucks with lift kits and pit bulls in the back, and they play on ukuleles and sing in Hawaiian. So the writing exercise is to write a pot block in vivid detail, the food that people bring, how you sit, where you sit, um, if there's any entertainment, and and do it at as rich as detail as you can. Now, the, then, should this be write what you know at Potluck as you experience it where you are now, or should you make one up? I want you to do first as you remember it, as you experienced it, so that you get that level of impression and then to make one up. And the make one up should have the same type of details that make the first one so real. Ah, well, this sounds great. Um, so uh, one could even make it a science fiction potluck if you wanted to, after you've, after you've done your, yes. your mundane one, or a fantasy. Yes. Well, excellent. So, you writers out there, get your butts to your chair bottoms and your hands to the keyboard or your pen to the page or your voice recognition software fired up, whatever it takes, uh, and write for the stars. And you can, as always, post and discuss on the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast website. Thanks so much, Wynn, for being with us. Okay. Thank you. And now we continue with our groundbreaking audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This excerpt from Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. I've been an Audible subscriber for years. I love the service and highly recommend it. All right, here's what's gone before. In Chapter 1 of Shadow of Freedom, we open with a drone strike on a possible insurgent on the planet Halkirk in the Loomis system. Loomis is a star system that is under the thumb of the autocratic Solarian League. Things don't look good for the party of local partisans who oppose Solarian occupation of the system. This group, the Loomis Liberation League, has been forced to give up on a political solution and has turned into a force for rebellion. Another strike on the same day takes out a Loomis Liberation League leader that the secret organization can ill afford to lose because they would run out of L's, apparently. 
A long hoped for shipment of powerful arms has not come through, and Liberation League leader Aaron McFadzine has to admit that without outside aid, and soon, her rebels will lose the fight for Free Loomis. But the Solarian League forces, led by Office of Frontier Security Officer Frankello Osborne and Solarian Navy Squadron Chief Captain Francine Vanelli, are not happy campers themselves. They dislike dealing with the venal politicians back home and the local leaders that they have to prop up, and they consider this Loomis bunch particularly bloodthirsty. It seems that the fuse of this powder keg situation is about to be lit. Here is David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 3. Innes McClay lay on his belly, peering cautiously out of the 60th floor window. For Hallkirk, that made his present perch a tall building, although the gleaming ceramicry towers SEIU had constructed in the heart of the city dwarfed it. Two of those towers were far less pristine than they had been, marked by the dark scars of multiple missile strikes and streaked with smoke from the fires which had consumed whole floors of their interiors, and Maclay showed his teeth briefly as he remembered watching the explosions ripple up and down their flanks. That had been when he thought the provost had a real chance. Now he knew better. They'd had the damned Yuppies on the run for the first couple of weeks, and maybe as many as a third of the smaller cities and towns had come in on the LLLP's side, or at least declared their neutrality. But that had been before they found out the friggin' OFS had called in the Sali Navy. His eyes went bleak and hard as he recalled the first kinetic strikes. McCrimmon and Macquarie hadn't seemed interested in taking prisoners. Maybe they just wanted to avoid the expense of building bigger re-education camps on Westray, or maybe they'd been scared enough they struck out in panic, or maybe they were just such bloody-minded bastards they'd decided to eliminate as many of the opposition as they could while the eliminating was good. McClay figured he'd never find out for sure which it had been, and it didn't much matter anyway. There'd been no warning, no call to surrender, no threats of orbital strikes at all. There'd been only the terrible white line streaming down through the skies of Hallkirk to pock the planetary surface with brimstone. That was what had broken the resistance's back. The first wave of strikes had taken out a dozen towns and the regional city of Conrock, whose city council had been the first to go over to the Liberation League when the provost seized the local UPS stations and the hub airport. No one knew how many had been killed, but Conrock's population had been over 85,000 all by itself, and there had been precious few survivors. So now they were left with this, he thought grimly. There was no surrender, not for the provost, not for the hard core like Innes McClay. They wouldn't last long in the camps anyway, even assuming they'd live long enough to get there, and he was damned if he'd give Macquarie and General Boyle the satisfaction. Besides, his wife and kids had been in Conrock, so they could just drag him out of his last burrow when the time came, and his teeth and claws would savage them the whole way. When he got to hell, he'd walk through the grates over the soles of all the Yuppies he'd sent ahead to wait for him. It wasn't much for a man to look forward to, but he'd settle for what he could get, and he stiffened, eyes narrowing. Then his jaw clenched, and he reached for the old-fashioned landline handset. The sound quality wasn't good, but it was a lot more secure than any of the regular comms, and not even Solly's sensors could localize and identify it against the background of the city's power systems. Yes? A voice at the other end answered. McClay, on the roof! he said tersely. They're coming. I've got eyes on at least a dozen tanks and twice that many APCs headed down Brown Hill towards Castle Grain. He paused for a moment. I think they've figured out where we are. Silence hovered at the far end of the line for seconds that felt like hours. Then... Understood, Innes. I expect you'll see a couple of missile teams up there in a minute or two. I'll be here. McClay replied and put down the phone. He moved from his observation post to the French doors that gave access to the apartment's small balcony. The protective sandbags piled just inside them weren't visible from ground level, and neither was the heavy tripod-mounted tri-barrel behind them. 
The field of fire wasn't perfect, and McClay was under no illusions about what the UP's heavy weapons teams would do to his improvised perch once they located his position. But a man couldn't have everything, and he expected he'd probably get to add at least a round dozen of them to his family's vengeance first. It's time for you to go, Megan, McFadzine said flatly as she hung up the phone. They're headed straight for us, and we don't have a prayer of stopping them. And where do you expect me to go, Erin? McLean asked almost whimsically. You want me to go hide in the logging camps? Put other people at risk for helping hide me? She shook her head and reached for the pulse rifle leaning in the corner behind her. I think not. Don't be stupid. McFadzine's voice was sharper, and she glared at the other woman. You're the league chairwoman, the one who can speak for us. Get the hell out of here, lie low, and then find a way to get off world. Undo what? McLean demanded. We're done, Erin. We're lost, and nobody else in the entire galaxy gives one single solitary damn what happens here on Halkirk. That's not true, McFadzine said. McLean stared at her in disbelief, and she shook her head. I... Didn't tell you everything, she said after a moment, looking away rather than meeting her friend's eyes. Our supplier for the weapons, he offered more than just guns when the time came. What are you talking about? McLean's eyes had narrowed. He told me he could get us naval support. McFadzine turned back to face her fully. When we were ready... If I got word to him, he was going to arrange things so we'd be the ones with starships in orbit. That's crazy. How was he supposed to do that? And why didn't you tell me about it? I didn't tell you about it because you already didn't trust him. McFadzine's voice was flatter than ever. You may even have been right. Probably he and his friends were only helping us for their own ends, but he told me he wasn't really a freelance arms dealer after all. That was just his cover, a way to provide deniability if the wheels came off. He told me he was actually speaking for his own government, that his queen was ready to come into the open to support us if it looked like we might pull off our end of it, and I believed him. Hell, maybe I just needed to believe him. But if you can get off-world... Find a way to contact him, maybe. She broke off, tears spangling her eyes, then shook herself savagely. God damn it, Megan. It's all we've got left. You're our chairwoman. If anyone can speak for us, you can. At least get out there and see to it that someone hears our side of what happened here. Don't let the bastard just sweep us and Conrad and all the rest of this shit under the rug like it never even happened. McLean stared at her for a moment, shaken to the marrow of her soul by the raw appeal in McFadzine's last sentence. I wouldn't even know how to contact him, she said finally. Something exploded in the near distance, the sound muffled but clear through the apartment building's walls. And that's assuming I could get off-world in the first place. Here, McFadzine tossed her data chip. The contact information's on there. She smiled crookedly. It's in my personal cipher, but you've got the key. McLean caught the chip. She looked down at it for a moment, then clenched her fist around it. I'm not running out and leaving you and everyone else behind, Erin. I'm just not doing it. Yes, you are, McFadzine told her as more explosions began to shake the command post. You owe it to us. She locked eyes with the other woman, and it was McLean's gaze that fell. Jamie will get you out through one of the tunnels, McFadzine said then. If the two of you can get out of Elgin, head for Hamer. I think our cell's still secure there. Lie low for a few weeks, and Tobias McGill, he's the cell later in Hamer, will fix you up with new papers. Then he and Jamie will get you onto one of the timber shuttles. From there... From there, you'll have to play it by air, but you can do it, Megan. You have to. I... McLean tried to find one last argument, but she couldn't, and there wasn't much time. 
She looked at her friend, the friend she knew was about to die with all those other friends, and she could hardly see through the blur of her tears. All right, she whispered. I'll try. Good. McFadzean stepped around the table and enveloped her in a brief, crushing hug. Good. Now go. McLean hugged her back for an instant longer, then nodded, grabbed her pulse rifle, and headed for the door. McFadzean watched her go, then picked up the handset again and pressed the button that connected her to every other handset simultaneously. Blar hulodar, she said simply. Let's buy some time for the tunnel rats. No fucking around this time, Colonel Nathan Mundy snarled over the battalion communications net. And no excuses either. Get in there, kick their asses, and bring me their fucking heads. Acknowledgments came back, and he smiled savagely as he settled deeper into his seat while his ground-effect command vehicle slid around the final corner and his direct vision screen showed him the apartment building the rebels had taken over. It didn't look any different from half a dozen other buildings they'd occupied across the capital, but this one was special. This was the one that was going to break the rebels once and for all because this was their central command post. He'd thought for a while that McPhee wasn't going to break, but the UPS had a way of convincing even the most recalcitrant. Maybe McPhee wouldn't have broken if they'd had only him to work on, but when they brought in his daughter... I suppose he still might have lied, the colonel thought harshly. Of course, if he did, he'll think what we already did to the bitch was nothing. Get closer, he barked at his driver. Sir, I get me closer, goddammit. Yes, sir. The tanks were Solarian surplus, at least two generations out of date, but some tank was always better than no tank, and their armor shed pulsar fire with contemptuous ease. They moved forward steadily, pounding the apartment building and the two structures to either side with fire from their main guns, 50-millimeter hypervelocity weapons with the firepower of a pre-space 150-millimeter cannon. Gouts of dust and smoke erupted, spewing showers of splintered ceramicrete and coaxially mounted tri-barrels spat thousands of explosive darts at their targets. It was impossible for anything to survive under that pounding, and the tank crews knew it. But the tank crews were wrong. The first anti-tank missile struck like Hell's Own Viper. The super-dense penetrator impacted on its target's frontal armor at just over 10,000 meters per second, and that armor might as well have been made of paper. The tank erupted in a thunderous fireball, and an instant later, there was a second fireball, and a third. Christ! Someone yelped over the command net. Where the fuck did they get that? Break right! Alfie, break right! The voice cut off abruptly. Innes McClay bellowed in wordless triumph as the first UPS tanks exploded. Then a pair of APCs encountered one of the improvised explosive devices the provost had buried in the sewers under Brown Hill Road. It wasn't powerful enough to destroy them outright, but the blast was more than enough to cripple them, and he watched their vehicle crews bail out, the UP scattering like blue-uniformed maggots. The grips of the tri-barrel were comfortable in his hands as he peered through the holographic sight and he squeezed the trigger stud. Nathalon Mundy stared at his readouts in disbelief. That bastard McPhee! He hadn't said a single word about weapons that heavy, and the rebels hadn't shown anything like that kind of firepower here in Elgin. How was he supposed to have realized... Another tank exploded, but this time one of its companions got a firm lock on the third-floor window from which it had come. A turret swiveled, a tank gun flashed, and half the floor behind that window disintegrated in a deafening explosion. McClay couldn't feel the shock of the explosion from his lofty perch, or at least he couldn't feel it clearly enough to separate it from all the other shocks and vibrations whiplashing through the building. He saw the tank fire, though, and it wouldn't have if it hadn't had a target. He wondered who'd just died, but it didn't matter. They could hurt the bastards, but they couldn't win, and he'd already heard the reports from the other side of the building. The UPs had to know exactly where they were. They were closing in from every direction, and McFadzine was right. Only those closest to one of the escape tunnels had any chance at all of getting out alive. Assuming someone else kept the UPs occupied, that was. 
he selected another target, slamming his heavy-caliber darts through the thinner top armor of one of the APCs. The 25-man personnel carrier staggered to a stop, then exploded, and his bloodshot eyes glittered with satisfaction. It was only a matter of time before someone spotted his firing position, but at the moment, they were more preoccupied with the missile teams than mere tri-barrels, and he swung his weapon's muzzle towards fresh prey. Fall back! Colonel Mundy snapped at his driver. Get us further back! Now, damn it! The driver snarled something that could have been an acknowledgement, and the command vehicle curtsied on its ground-effect cushion as he spun it around. The sensor cluster kept the apartment building centered in Mundy's display even as the vehicle turned away, and a cursor flashed on the screen highlighting a balcony on the 60th floor. An icon appeared beside it as the command vehicle's computers identified the energy signature. Mundy's eyes widened as he recognized the data code. Tri-barrel? A corner of his brain gobbled. That's a tri- The GEV erupted in a boiling cloud of red and black. It tore apart, incinerating its crew, and Innes McClay howled in triumph. It was brief, that triumph, no more than seconds before one of the surviving UPS tanks put a round from its main armament right through the balcony's French doors. But it was enough. This way, Megan. Jamie curbishly said hoarsely. We're almost there. Megan McLean nodded, wading through the ankle-deep water at her guide's heels, trying not to think about what was happening behind her. There were perhaps twenty more people in the tunnel with her, stretched out in a long, grim-faced queue, most of them people who still had, or might still have, family somewhere on the other side of Holocaust, people who knew their friends, Friends who no longer had anyone waiting for them had chosen to stay behind and cover their escape. She put her hand into her pocket, feeling the hard edges of the chip folio, wondering who the man who had called himself partisan really was, if he'd told McFadzine the truth about his official status, or if it had all been a lie. And if it hadn't, what had he and the star nation who'd sent him really intended? Why had they offered to help the Liberation League? Whatever McFadzine might have thought, it hadn't been out of the bigness of their hearts. McLean was certain of that, and God knew they had enough problems of their own at the moment. Had they simply been looking for a way to distract their enemies? That might well make sense, she supposed. But it was also possible it hadn't all been cynical, pragmatic calculation on their part. They had a reputation for standing up for lost causes. Maybe they even deserved it, and if they did... And if she really could get off-world and reach them somehow, maybe this nightmare slaughter wouldn't have been entirely in vain after all. Maybe... Down! Kerbishly screamed. McLean responded instantly, throwing herself down on her belly in the ice water even before she realized she'd moved. She landed with a splash, hearing shouts behind her, and raised her head just in time to see the heavily armored UPS troops plummeting down the ladder from the manhole above with their pulse rifles flaming in full automatic. It was the last thing she ever saw. Frinkello Osborne stood on the landing platform of SEIU Tower, his face hard and set as he watched fresh smoke billow up to join the dense, choking cloud hovering above the Loomis system's capital. Over twenty percent of Elgin's buildings had taken at least some damage, he thought disgustedly. Macquarie insisted it wasn't that bad, and it was possible his own estimate was high because of the revulsion and fury boiling through his brain, but he didn't think so. She was a liar trying to cover her own arse, and she was going to have plenty of covering to do now that the shooting was over. Just what he could see from his present vantage point was going to cost billions to repair— and the damage here in Elgin was nothing compared to what Captain Vanelli's KEWs, not to mention the UPS's kill teams, had done to the rest of the planet. He remembered his conversation with Vanelli in Hoplite's briefing room, and his hand rose, touching the hard angularity of the holstered pulsar under his left armpit. Tempting. So tempting. He could walk into Zagorski's penthouse office and no one would think twice about admitting him. And once he got there... He took his hand away from the pistol again and grimaced bleakly. The thought might be tempting, but he wasn't about to act on it, and he knew it. 
just as he knew the real reason he wanted to paint Nyatui Zagorsky's office walls with his brains. Osborne had served OFS well for longer than he liked to remember, but this was the worst. Somehow, he'd always managed to avoid the details like this one. But now he'd climbed down into the sewer with the worst of them, and he'd never be clean again. And the worst of it, he thought in the cold, cruel light of honesty, is that now that I've done it once, it'll be easier the next time. And if I stay with it long enough, there will be a next time. There always is. He stood for another few minutes, gazing at the blazing apartment building, wondering how much longer it would stand before its skeleton collapsed into the inferno, wondering if there was anyone still alive inside that furnace, praying for death. Then he turned and walked silently away. It was still and dark in the smoke-choked sewer under the city of Elgin. There was no light, no movement, no life. Not any longer, and a data chip folio settled slowly, slowly through the bloody water into the sludge below. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 3. Join us next time as we continue our journey through this best-selling novel. And that's it for the podcast today. Thanks to Hank Davis and composer Ruth Judkowitz, who created March to the Stars, our podcast theme, which can give you an earworm, let me tell you. High thanks and praise to Bain authors Frank Chadwick and Wynne Spencer. And thanks to Audible.com. Please join us next time and keep reaching for the stars.